welcome to Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Today's episode is part of the Cannabis Education Series brought to you by the AMA Cannabis Task Force. I'm Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, Senior Associate Dean, Tenured Professor of Anesthesiology, and Director of the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I'm also the immediate past president of the AMA and co-chair of the AMA Cannabis Task Force. Michael, take it away. Thanks, Jesse. I'm Dr. Michael Sook, professor and chair of the Musculoskeletal Institute and the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Geisinger Health System. I'm chair of the AMA Board of Trustees and your co-chair of the AMA Cannabis Task Force. Through expert discussions and insights, this podcast series features information that can help physicians of all specialties understand cannabis and the health effects of cannabis use. The AMA forms mission-specific task forces like this one to tackle current medical issues in our nation. Make your voice heard by becoming a member today. Visit ama-assn.org slash more. And now, on to the show. Michael. Joining me today to talk about cannabis pharmacology is Samir Naruz, an anesthesiologist and pain medicine specialist who is a professor at the Northeast Ohio University College of Medicine. Samir, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Sock, for having me. Well, I'd like to start by discussing the chemicals within cannabis that have activity within the body. Could you talk to us a little bit about the chemical agents within cannabis that we should know about? Sure. Uh, the cannabis plants contains lots of cannabinoids, maybe more than 100 cannabinoids. The most studied of them, the most important to us clinically, uh, are two main ones. The first one is the THC, or the Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. This is the most recognized and the most studied chemical in the plant. This is the one that has the main psychoactive uh, effects from the plant. The other one, which is the CBD, or the Cannabidiol, this is less psychoactive and actually lacks the uh, side effects or the psychoactive effects from THC. It's more prevalent in the hemp plant. Uh, there are other chemicals in the plant, but the, uh, relatively, they are not well studied. We don't know much about them. And this is the uh, issue when studying or reading clinical papers on the plant that we really don't know much about the other 100 plus uh, molecules in the plant. But as we said, the two most common one, the relevant to us, are the THC and the CBD. Thanks, Dr. Norris. Would you say that uh, THC, CBD are clearly the most studied among the cannabinoids that are out there? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how those chemicals act in the body? Yeah. So those are the, the what we talked about, the THC and the CBD. Those are the phytocannabinoids. Phyto means from the plant. There are other uh, cannabinoids. We call them endocannabinoids. They are naturally occurring in the body. And this leads us to talk about the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system is one of the most important and relevant neuromodulatory systems in the body that controls lots of CNS function and complex uh, cell signaling. It comprises of four things. First, the endogenous cannabinoids. There are quite a few of them. Again, the two major ones are the uh, 2-AG and the anandamide. They are the two main endocannabinoids. They are working on two enzymes, cannabinoid receptor type 1, cannabinoid receptor type 2. And then there are a few enzymes that manufacture them and metabolize them. And then there are uh, proteins responsible for transferring those molecules through the cell membrane in and out of the cell. So in general, the endocannabinoid system consists of the endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids, the two cannabinoid receptors, the enzymes that manufacture and metabolize the endocannabinoid, and the protein that's responsible for transferring those molecules in and out of the cell. So the two major receptors, site of actions of cannabinoids in general, are cannabinoid receptor 1 and cannabinoid receptor 2. Generally speaking, cannabinoid receptor 1 are centrally located, which means they are 
abundant in the CNS, spinal cord, dorsal root ganglia. That's why they are responsible for the behavior components of the pain modulation. On the other hand, the type 2 receptor, cannabinoid type 2 receptor, they are peripherally located, which means that they are in the, uh, more in the immune system. However, with stress, with uh, injury, with acute inflammation, the body got the signal to manufacture more of them. So they are upregulated and they can be expressed in the CNS, mainly in the microglia and astrocyte. That's why they might have a potential important role in the modulation of uh, neuroinflammation. The two known endocannabinoids are the 2-AG and anandamide. The 2-AG works more on the cannabinoid receptor, CB1 and CB2. However, the anandamide acts mainly on the CB1, so it has more central mechanism of action. What's unique about the anandamide that it also modulates an important receptor. We call it the TRPV1, which is well known as the capsaicin receptor, which is responsible for temperature. That's why those molecules also have an important role in temperature regulations. That is useful information to understand when it comes to cannabis and its actions within the body. Could you tell us about the pharmacokinetics? This may help physicians understand the clinical implications these agents may have on their practice. The pharmacokinetics of uh, the cannabis or cannabinoid in general uh, is very diverse because it depends mainly on the route of administration, how you take it. Uh, so uh, the most common routes of administration are inhalation or vaping, and there are oral, which we call them the edibles. And then there are the topical or transdermal ones. So inhalation it's like the smoking or vaping. Uh, this leads to rapid increase in the plasma level of the cannabis or cannabinoids, THC. Actually, within a few seconds of smoking, they would be detected in the plasma. And the THC are very lipophilic, which means very lipid solid. So it crosses the blood-brain barrier quickly. So within a minute or two, uh, the uh, patient will feel the effect of the inhaled cannabis. However, it's the duration of action is shorter. So it reaches peak plasma concentration in a few minutes, but shorter duration of action. Bioavailability is very variable. It could be as low as 10% or as high as 30 or 40%. Why? Because it depends on how you smoke or how you vape. What's the pattern? The number of inhalation, the depth of inhalation, the duration of inhalation, are you doing breath holding or not? All those will affect the bioavailability of the inhaled cannabis. On the other hand, the oral one is different. The oral one, it has slow onset of action. It takes time till the patient feels the effect or the user feels the effect. It, it might take up to two or three or four hours to reach the maximum plasma effect because of the slow absorption and the first pass metabolism. The duration of action can last longer, but the onset of action can be two to three hours, different than the few minutes from inhalation. Why we talk about this? Because this has very clinical relevance uh, to us as practitioners. The uh, patient, they start to in in ingest a little bit of the, uh, the edible one. They don't feel the effect that they used to get with inhalation because in two minutes, they will feel it. So they tend to take more, ingest more and more because they are waiting for the response. They feel that they are taking small dose. They are not aware that it's low action. It takes time to have a peak plasma. That's why they got in trouble. The transdermal one, um, it's more common with CBD because CBD is less lipophilic. So it's not as lipid soluble as uh, THC. So it can be used as a transdermal, still THC, but the bioavailability is very low because it cannot cross through the aqueous media of the skin. But it's another uh, uh, route of administration. Bioavailability is very 
uh, very variable and slow. Medicine doesn't stand still, and neither do we. AMA members don't just keep up with medicine, they shape its future. Help move medicine, join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash movingmedicine. Dr. Rose, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about uh, distribution of cannabis once in the body, its metabolism, and ultimately its elimination. Sure. Uh, this is a very tough topic, but uh, there are lots of uh, basic signs, let, uh, literature that uh, describe the distribution. It varies uh, if the patient is uh, infrequent users versus frequent users, that folio distribution is variable. There are to be administration different, but in general, those molecules, THC and CBD, are very lipophilic. So they cross the blood-brain barrier quickly. They have very high peak plasma quickly after inhalation. And then they get distributed to the highly vascular organs vessel, uh, then to the less uh, vascularized organs, and then they get stored in the adipose tissue. Later on, they could be released. They equilibrate again uh, with the blood from the adipose tissue. That's why we call it three-phase distribution model. This is important that THC gets stored in the adipose tissue and then can be re-released later, especially in frequent users or heavy users. Why? Because it affects the detection of the metabolites in the uh, urine sample or even the platinum. So you can inhale or smoke the THC and you still show metabolites in your urine actually for up to weeks. So this is important when we determine when the patient last used the substance. The metabolism is very fascinating. Why? Because most of the cannabinoids, and we're going to talk mainly about the THC, THC and the CBD, they are metabolized by the uh, cytochrome P450. Variable isoenzymes different from THC and CBD. This is relevant clinically because it, uh, it has potential drug-drug interactions medications are metabolized by different substrates uh, or are different substrates to the cytochrome B450. So any other substance or medicine that either inhibit or stimulate those cytochrome P450 enzymes, accordingly, they will affect the concentration of THC or CBD. They metabolize to some of them are active metabolites. So mainly they are metabolized in the liver. THC metabolized mainly to 11-hydroxy uh, THC, which is, has still psychoactive effects. It's an active metabolite and actually long-acting. And this why, again, the metabolites will be detected in the urine for maybe even a few weeks after its use. Same with CBD. It's metabolized mainly to uh, other less active substances with longer duration of action. Thanks, Dr. Rouge. You know, now that we understand the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of the chemical structures, can you bring this home clinically for us and share with us some clinical considerations of all the information you've given us so far? Interactions with the cannabinoid to the receptor, it dictates the signaling, uh, intracellular signaling, which eventually will lead to decrease in the release of the excitatory neurotransmitters. The type 2 receptors are mainly peripherally and are responsible for the anti-inflammatory uh, effects of the uh, uh, THC and mainly CBD. It affects the body in, in variable uh, mechanisms. So mainly on the cardiovascular system, usually in small infrequent doses, you are stimulating the sympathetic. So it increases the sympathetic drive. And this will lead to tachycardia, some tachyarrhythmias, and actually maybe vasospasm, or vasoconstriction of the blood vessels and even the coronaries, even without high risk factors for coronary only disease. Uh, on the GI system, it can lead to uh, antinausea and unvomiting effect in small doses. This leads us to know that the effect, physiological effect, varies depending on the organ. The uh, expression of the receptors are more 
type 1 or type 2 receptors, and the dose of the THC. That actually, we have a synthetic THC that's FDA approved for the treatment of severe nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. However, in high doses, it leads to actual nausea and vomit. Respiratory effects, it's no brainer that if you are using the molecule by smoking or vaping, you will cause irritation, uh, bronchospasm, chronic user, they are risk for COPD. Medicine doesn't stand still, and at the AMA, neither do we. AMA members are physicians like you who are shaping the future of medicine. Become a member today and join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash moving medicine. There is also cannabis withdrawal symptoms, and we see this only uh, or mainly in the heavy users, long-term users, or more than 20 days a month they can get into cannabis withdrawal symptoms, which mainly present as lack of sleep, uh, anxiety, pain, which is the paradoxical effect, pain, tachycardia, tremors, but usually it's not really serious than the other withdrawal symptoms that we see with other substances. There is an important point that we need to make also because THC is highly lipophilic, it readily crosses the placenta and also it's excreted in the breast milk. So it's our obligation to counsel the pregnant uh, patients on the use of uh, cannabis or your cannabis uh, product because of the potential effect on the uh, embryo and the newborn. That's great, Dr. Rose. In uh, closing, I think I wanted to summarize just a couple points. One is that uh, cannabis, uh, as you've described, has two main active agents, THC and CBD, that both work through the endocannabinoid system. The pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of cannabis is not well understood and has the potential for many variations based on patient-specific factors. And finally, there may be clinical scenarios where patients may be more at risk for adverse events based on the pharmacodynamics of cannabis. And I think with those summary points, I wanted to thank you for joining us uh, on this educational series uh, and uh, for sharing your knowledge of the cannabis pharmacokinetics. Thank you, Dr. Saka and the MA for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. Don't miss the next episode in this series. Be sure to subscribe to Moving Medicine on your favorite podcast platform. This content is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute medical or legal advice. The viewpoints expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not reflect the views and policies of the AMA unless otherwise indicated. And this has been Moving Medicine. Thanks for listening.